Hi, this is Don Forsyth, the Jefferson School of Leadership at the University of Richmond, speaking to you about uh, groups, and in particular social influence, majority, minority influence, and the sources of influence, but winding things up, I want to talk a little bit about juries. I mean, there must be literally billions of groups existing on the planet at any one time, and they're fascinating, uh, these groups, uh, military squads the board of directors of a company, of an organization, sports teams, pretty interesting groups. Uh, but juries, perhaps, are particularly fascinating. Juries have been around perhaps longer than any other form of group where you think of a, a gathering of perhaps elders who made decisions about a community's norms and standards being violated, of guilt or innocence, or who has committed crime and who hasn't. Uh, our traditional form of juries that we see here in, in the United States dates back to the, the founding of the country um, and English forms of jury decision making where the jury came together and in some cases provided information, uh, facts relevant to the case, but also served as decision makers within the case. In the American system, the present, presentation of facts and information is no longer the responsibility of the jury. The jury is to weigh the facts and information presented um, by both sides in the trial and make a final decision. Uh, there's perhaps as many as 300,000 juries meeting in any particular year in the United States, weighing evidence and making decisions. I want to talk briefly about the dynamics of, of juries, raise questions about how effective they are, and, and touch just briefly on improving juries. But we'll start just with the idea about what a jury might be. And again, by tradition, it's the finder of fact to make a decision about guilt and innocence. Its interesting characteristics are it is to be impartial. Uh, the, the jury members don't actually know the individuals who are involved in the case. Um, if you did, you, you might not be able to serve on the jury. It's also supposed to be representative of the community. So these are community members sampled in some particularly objective way that represents the judgments of the group. And yet, juries, as a means of making decision, make people nervous because, well, at core they are groups, and people do have a uncertainty about the rationality of groups. Albert Hubbard, um, one of my favorite wits, says, what is a jury? The stupidity of one brain multiplied by 12. Uh, Shakespeare him, himself suggested the jury passing on the prisoner's life may have sworn 12 a thief or two guiltier than him they try, which isn't really a bad thing. Um, our civilization has decided that determining the guilt or innocence of men is a thing too important to be trusted by trained individuals. Instead, we turn to untrained individuals, members of the community, to make the decision. And we certainly hope that our juries will be filled with very intelligent individuals, civic-minded individuals, but we fear that, in fact, um, that they are not. That, that in fact, uh, we find our juries are more likely 12 prejudiced, gullible dolts, some Simpsons, for example, incapable of understanding the evidence or law involved in the case. Uh, the movie, uh, Runaway Jury, which came out several years ago, it's based on a John Grisham novel who himself was a lawyer, but it has within it a villain, uh, Rankin Fitch, who systematically manipulates the jury. He tries to uh, use techniques to put the right people on the jury so he can get the right outcome and the, the takeaway theme in this particular Trials are too important to be left up to juries. According to Rankin Fitch. So, the jury system um, remains in place, however, uh, and perhaps the best evidence of its effectiveness is that we continue to turn to juries to make critically important decisions about guilt and innocent. It provides a counterbalance to judicial abuse. It does represent the community in many cases, rep represents the community's values. It reduces the uh, professional level of the decision. Uh, there's a reason why these are regular people making decisions about other regular people. But the question is, as juries, as they are groups, so the question is whether or not social influence within these groups is so excessive 
that the groups actually make poor decisions rather than good ones. Well, what does research tell us about juries then? What can we draw on? There, there've been a, there's a, a long line of very fascinating studies of, of juries. Calvin and Zeifel's study, the American jur jury, was a classic one. Um, there's research by Hastie and his colleagues looking at inside the jury and inside the mind of the jury. And in fact, social scientists were able to do some, some pretty extensive work on juries back in the 50s. They were given permission to record deliberations and then analyze the processes that jur juries used in those deliberations, looking to see how thoroughly they reviewed the information and whether or not, for example, majority influence pressures were so great that individuals who disagreed with the majority could not express themselves um, that work uh, ended um, when uh, federal judges intervened and said there there can be no more bugging of uh, deliberation rooms um, in juries. And so now the researchers have moved uh, to investigate that by interviewing juries after jurors after the fact, and also to study simulated juries bringing together individuals, often from the jury pool, to make decisions under controlled circumstances to see how well they do. So, in reviewing this, let's go through a few uh, questions, or, or myths, if you will, about juries. The first one being, jurors do not take their tasks seriously. They resent and shirk their obligation. I've been called for jury duty. Um, it is an interruption in your usual routine. You have to go down to the courthouse. You have to sit in a large room with many other individuals who may or may not be called for to sit on a particular jury. Um, you're paid a very small amount of money for doing that. Um, many people would like to perhaps get out of their jury duty. But when they do poll people about the importance of being on a jury um, in terms of their civic responsibility, most strongly agree that a jury duty is an important civic duty I should meet, even if inconvenient. That's a pretty substantial number. Suggesting that jurors do take their tasks seriously, they, they do not shirk their obligation. And this is from a, a, fairly, uh, a fairly representative Harris poll on the subject. Jury duty is a burden to be avoided. Most people agree that uh, with disagree with that idea. Again, most people thought it was important to do your job. If I were a participant in a jury, I would want a jury to decide my case rather than a judge. Um, most people, despite concerns that juries uh, are groups and therefore prone to irrationality, would prefer to have a group of their peers make the decision. Um, if you combine strongly agree and agree, it's overwhelmingly in favor. Of a, of a judge making the final decision. So myth number two, jurors are overwhelmed by the cognitive demands of jury service. This is the idea that in some cases, uh, trials can raise comp questions which are so complicated that the ordinary person won't be able to understand them. Research looking at jurors and how they make decisions do tend to find uh, two basic approaches jurors take, evidence-driven ju jurors uh, they tend to listen to the evidence closely. They, they take an inductive approach rather than reaching a decision too quickly. Uh, they wait for all the evidence to come in and then they try to uh, organize the evidence in, in some way. And of course the, the lawyers for both sides will suggest the best story which organizes the evidence. Uh, but an evidence-based jury will resist drawing a conclusion prematurely before all the evidence is. is. Verdict-driven jurors uh, enter the situation just saying, with the basic question, guilty, not guilty, what's my basic decision? And then as information comes in, they wonder whether or not the new evidence supports their initial inclinations or doesn't support their initial inclinations. You do find that when you create a jury of, say, 12 individuals, you will get a mix of verdict-driven jurors and evidence-driven jurors. So you'll find some individuals who want to know more about, well, how do all the pieces fit together in a coherent story? And others just want to get on with making a decision about the verdict. Again, the, uh, the film 12 Angry Men illustrates the difference between these two approaches. The minority lone holdout is, is uh, he is an evidence-driven juror. He needs a story which will make sense of all the pieces of evidence which viewed together are, are not easily explained by a verdict of guilt. Whereas most of the other jurors went in, 
listening to the initial case, they decided the person was guilty and they moved on from that. But in general, um, both verdict-driven and information-driven jurors, verdict-driven and evidence-driven jurors are capable of doing the cognitive work necessarily to make a good decision. A third myth, and it is true that the, the example I use repeatedly to demonstrate social influence is 12 Angry Men. 12 Angry Men is a, an unlikely group, however, because you had a single individual influence 11 other individuals in the voting process. So it's a rare sort of group because in most cases, majority rules in, in juries. So if uh, you, you have a strong belief in the wisdom of, of the crowd, of majority rule being a good decision rule, then you should have confidence in a jury. So for example, if you look at the, the numbers of groups making decisions about acquittal, if you look at the district votes on the very first ballot, if most believe the acquittal, the final decision will be acquittal. It's very rarely that you find most people believe in conviction with the final decision being acquittal. Same thing applies for a hung jury. Where's the hung jury you can see? Rarely do you find in a hung jury that there were, um, this would be the 12 Angry Men jury, that little snippet there where you found most of the jurors believe the person was, was guilty. Um, and yet the jury hung. You, that's very rare. Usually a hung jury means that the, the, the members of the jury go in with the very differing viewpoints. They're split initially. There's a slight majority. There's a slight minority. But that's the more likely hung majority. And then we have our final example of a voting for conviction. A jury is much more likely to vote for a conviction if on the first vote, the first ballot, most people believe the defendant is guilty. So you see that the, the, the jury in 12 Angry Men is a, a rare jury, although it can happen, I suppose. Myth four, juries like all groups can become so strong that they overwhelm the individual members. And yes, certainly there are dramatic pressures applied on groups. As in earlier discussions, we spoke of informational influence, normative influence, implicit sources of influence, and interpersonal influence. All of those are present. And pressures are put on dissenters, suggesting that they comply. And in fact, if you look at the distribution of communication in a jury, you do find it, in fact, rather startling that some members of the jury do not speak at all. The, uh, the, the top two or three most vocal jurors uh, may dominate the group's discussion by as much as having 80% of the comments, and you find that the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th jurors, in, in terms of not speaking, speak not at all. The only time they do speak is actually when the, the vote is taking. So they're relatively uninfluential, obviously, if they do not speak at all. Whereas other members of the group are more influential. And you worry that those individuals who do most of the talking are exerting undue influence upon the group. So whatever opinions they have, um, they force them on to the other group members. Here's a nice Norman Rockwell picture where it illustrates the influence of a group dramatically. This person is not part of the influence, but the rest of the individuals who have gathered around this one group member who happens to be a woman, and they are attempting to persuade her. There's, of course, an element of sexism in this particular picture because it, it is suggesting that this woman um, may not be able to see the world as men might see, but... Um, it was a long time ago when they were just discussing the idea that women should actually be a part of groups because for many years, as recently as the 1970s, women were routinely excluded from service on groups for sexist reasons primarily. I might mention that yes, the groups are, the juries are groups with strong social influences, but these uh, pressures are held in check by the way the group is designed. These are strangers to each other. They do not know each other. They won't know each other when the group leaves. Um, there's, there's many, in many cases, uh, groups will vote anonymously. So the strong situation can be turned into a weaker situation as well. In many cases, names are not even used in groups. In 12 Angry Men, there's no mention of anyone's names. They go only by juror number to make them feel even more anonymous. Um, all individuals are to be recognized as equal in status. 
although individuals who are more highly educated who work in the professions do tend to be more influential in groups than individuals from working class backgrounds and who have not got as much education as others in the groups. Um, how effective are juries? Myth five. Um, we've recently seen and routinely see juries making decisions that we don't understand. Um, for example, there have been very high profile juries in Florida making decisions uh, based upon the, the stand your ground um, orientation in that particular state that others wonder how a jury could make such a decision. The question is whether or not that was the right decision. Obviously, it's hard to know uh, because that's the reason juries exist is to make the decision, to weigh the facts, to weigh the evidence. Um, no one knows if the individual is guilty or innocent. Well, the defendant might know, I suppose. But, um, you know, in, in other words, there's no way to validate a, a jury's decision. But there is evidence uh, that groups, juries, use very good processes in making their decisions. When they ask judges later on, well, judge, what do you think about the decision made by that jury? There's 80% agreement between what the judge thought the verdict should be and what the jury has decided, which is good evidence. Um, and again, the jury itself is designed to minimize bias. It's representative of the community. Um, and as they study, um, for example, variations in, in the process itself, there are some biases, for example, men and women are different, age of juries are different, but they're relatively small biases that we hope are washed out by the larger juries. Um, and again, against juries, you know, there, there is some evidence that juries came, in some cases, particularly extremely technical um, decisions which must be made. For example, there have been recent cases of uh, in which uh, one company has sued another company for patent violations. And you actually needed to know some engineering about electronics in order to make an informed decision. And so the one individual on the group who had a background in engineering was perhaps more influential than he should have been because the rest of the jurors didn't have that expertise. Um, there's also the problem of representativeness um, that in, in some cases even a jury of 12 doesn't adequately represent the composition of the community. It, attempts to represent. So there are some, also some other studies suggesting that if there's too much information to be presented, it will overwhelm the group. But overall, um, juries seem to do well. So in recounting the myths uh, regarding juries, juries do not take their task seriously, resent, that's nah, not true. Um, juries are overwhelmed by the kind of, nah, that's not true either. The jury in 12 anger men is typical? No, actually, majority tends to rule. Juries, like all groups, can become so strong. They, there are strong social pressures, but in general, that's not true either. Juries make mistakes, perhaps they do, but they tend to uh, make accurate judgments rather than inaccurate ones. So the last myth is the, the one that perhaps is mentioned in runaway juries, that trials are too important to be left up to juries. Well, that's not the case. It's the idea is that uh, trials are too important to be left up to anyone but juries. So those myths we can dispense with. There is some research looking at how juries can improve, and so in the, in the future, um, as we learn more and more about groups in general, we can apply that understanding to improving juries as well. Uh, the size of the jury does not make a consistent difference. Larger juries are certainly more representative of the community than smaller ones. But as we saw earlier, social impact forces tend to well, they reach their peak in four-person groups, so so long as a jury has uh, four individuals on it, uh, then, then the majority processes and minority process we've already discussed are, are probably going to be present. Um, there have been some cases in which juries don't have to make unanimous decisions, um, that the jury can be 10 to 12 or 5 out of 6 and the, the verdict will be rendered. Um, and it does look like that if unanimity is not required, juries move more quickly to make their decisions. And the worry is they do not review the evidence as thoroughly as they would if unanimity is required. And of course, it reduces the possibility of hung juries, but is more efficient. The jury's still out on that particular question.
There's also been changes in procedures such as videotaping the trials and showing that to a sequestered jury, allowing jury members to take notes, allowing jury members to ask questions, to submit questions, which will be put to witnesses is another variation. And so these variations are all tried and they might Im improve the overall efficiency of groups. Uh, while deer is a, another process well, well, we can wrap that up. It's uh, runaway jury is based on the process of voir dire and examining that. And that's the step where uh, the, uh, the lawyers for both sides can challenge a, a juror and dismiss him or her from the jury for whatever reason they like. And in some cases, they, they need not provide any reason. In other cases, they may have to explain why they're rejecting a juror. But this is generally done by both sides so that they uh, can stack, if you will, the juror, get a jury which is uh, going to be more favorable for their side rather than the other side. There is a, a science, of course. In this process, one would have to know a great deal about groups and group dynamics in order for you to rig a jury in this way. But overall, overall um, researchers suggest there should be constraints on voir dire um, so that it isn't used as a method to uh, art artificially um, modify the composition of the jury so that its processes and its eventual decision uh, um, does not reflect community standards. Thank you, as always, for joining me in our analysis of uh, group processes. See you next time.